Good afternoon. So our first talk today is on uh, radiation oncology. So we have Elizabeth Nichols. She's an associate professor from the University of Maryland. So she uh, was an undergrad at Duke and then went to the University of Maryland Medical Center. And she did her residency there. And she uh, is going to talk to us today about radiation oncology. Liz. Right. Well, thank you everyone for having me today. Um, it's my pleasure to, to talk to everyone. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about radiation oncology, um, how radiation works in the body, um, some of the principles we think about um, from a therapeutic viewpoint. Um, we'll go through kind of the process of radiation therapy as well, um, as there are some steps that most people are not familiar with, um, and talk about a couple cases to kind of solidify some of that knowledge. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, and again, here's our outline for today. Just talk about the goals of cancer therapy, specifically focus on some of the goals of radiation therapy, some of the basics of radiation oncology, and then some of the exciting um, areas of research in radiation oncology as well, and how they may, may interact with some of the work that's being done um, here and abroad. So in terms of the principles of cancer therapy, um, there's multiple principles that we really generally operate upon. Um, one of those is to minimize therapy. So we always want to give patients the minimum therapy that's needed to essentially cure their cancer or make them feel better. Um, and this is important because we always want to minimize our toxicities of therapy, um, which can be from surgery, from chemotherapy, from radiation, from immunotherapy. We want to minimize the time that patients are in our clinics uh, for these therapies, as well as minimizing the cost of therapy. So um, as many people are familiar with, there's increasing cost of cancer therapy due to innovations in some of the new drugs, and minimizing the receipt of this therapy will also minimize healthcare costs. We also are always looking to minimize the negative impact on patients' quality of life. So again, looking at toxicity, function, and cosmesis. So for example, when we talk about function, uh, a long time ago when we first started to treat sarcomas of the extremities, we used to do an amputation. Uh, well, now we no longer have to do that. We're able to actually do limb, pre limb preserving therapy. And with cosmesis, the, the classic example is with breast cancer, thinking about a mastectomy compared to a lumpectomy plus radiation maintains that uh, patient's breast cosmesis. We are usually looking to improve patients' quality of life. So this is very pertinent for patients who have metastatic or stage four cancer. Um, oftentimes radiation therapy is used for a palliation viewpoint where a patient may have a bone metastasis that's causing significant pain. We can actually treat that bone metastasis with radiation and improve the patient's pain and need for narcotics. Uh, also looking at organ preservation. So uh, in bladder cancer, patients can choose to undergo a cystectomy or removal of the entire bladder versus a bladder preserving approach where we use radiation and chemotherapy uh, so we can uh, preserve their organ. We are always looking to maximize our impact on the quantity of life, so looking for cures and remissions, and then always looking to advance our cancer outcomes, which of course uh, involves research and many of the works that uh, are being done here. In general, the discipline of radiation oncology is really divided into three separate groups, uh, focusing on radiation biology, uh, radiation therapy, as well as uh, physics, and specifically with medical physics. And these all combine together um, to work uh, to really allow us to actually treat patients. So moving on to just some of the basics of uh, the physics of radiation oncology, and I, I jokingly say this is just the basics. Um, again, this is a whole separate field, which also includes a medical physics residency in order to become a, a medical physicist. Um, so if we think about, well, what actually is radiation? Um, so radiation is the complete process by which energy is emitted by one body, transmitted through an intervening medium or space, and then absorbed by another body. There are multiple different types of radiation, um, including alpha particles, which you can see here, beta particles, and gamma rays, uh, which are very synonymous to photons. Um, alpha particles um, travel very short distances and can be stopped by very thin things. So most people are familiar with the Fukushima disaster in Japan um, several years ago. And one of the things that, that uh, people in the area were told is to wear long sleeves and long pants, keep your skin covered. And the reason for that is actually that clothing can block these alpha particles. So it actually protected people's skin. 
Beta particles can tra uh, travel a little bit further. So generally we say beta particles travel about two to three millimeters um, before they can stop. And very, um, our, our non-dense metals like aluminum uh, can actually stop beta particles. Um, so we have many therapies that use beta particles like prostate seed implants and so forth. And then gamma rays are our most kind of classic radiation that we use therapeutically. Um, and these are often stopped by concrete. So in our vaults where we uh, deliver radiation therapy, there's typically about six feet of concrete uh, that are in the vault, and that's enough to actually make sure we stop all the penetration of any photons or potential gamma rays. So when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum and we talk about radiation, where we're operating from a therapeutic viewpoint is all the way out here um, in the gamma ray uh, area. Um, so just to kind of put that all into perspective. So how are x-rays generated? So on the left here is a general schematic of an x-ray tube, um, which often is a, a very simplistic version of, say, how an x-ray machine would work. So um, you have your anode and your cathode, and this operates in a vacuum. Uh, and then you apply an electrical current across this to develop the x-ray beam. Um, this, in a much more fancy version, is actually in what we call here, which is called a linear accelerator, which we often abbreviate as a LINAC. Um, so this is, uh, Varian is one of the general vendors uh, used in our country. There's, there's a couple of those. Um, and so what happens is this part here is called the gantry. Um, and this is the head of the machine. And this is actually where the photon uh, or electrons come out of the machine here. The patient lies on the black tabletop here. And this tabletop can rotate up, down, side to side, um, and then rotate kind of in a hemicircle way around the, lin the linear accelerator. And then some of the new modern uh, machines um, can also have this table have a pitch and a yaw so that the, the table can actually rotate slightly on top uh, or with the patient on top of it. This part here actually rotates around the patient in a 360 degree um, uh, movement. Um, so we get all of those angles. And then a lot of the actual machinery that operates this, believe it or not, is not pictured here. So it's either under the ground or oftentimes this is at the, the back of a wall and behind that wall is a lot of other machinery. But basically kind of this in a more uh, fancy version is all located right here at the top of the machine. Um, so as I mentioned, um, linear accelerators can create both high energy photons as well as electrons. Um, in general, what happens here um, is the, the, there's an electron gun that shoots electrons into the machine. They then go through this waveguide here uh, there's bending magnets, which then slam those electrons into a piece of metal, which then creates photons. And so that's actually how that happens. If we're in an electron mode, we remove that piece of metal so photons are not created. When we look at the beam um, that comes out of, of a machine, it has what we call uniform beam characteristics. And so what that means is if you actually radiated a piece of film and you had a measuring device as it went across that film from left to right, you would actually measure the same uh, dose of radiation at each of those points. Um, and there's a lot of things that help shape the beam to make sure that we have these uniform beam characteristics. We're able to shape the field very precisely and then deliver very precise treatment um, through a lot of these motions that I just mentioned, gantry rotation, couch rotation. And then patients are also immobilized so that they don't move during therapy. And we have a variety of different types of immobilization devices that I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, when we talk about some of the basics of radiation therapy, some of the general um, lingo, if you will, that we use um, are things such as here. So GTV stands for the gross tumor volume. CTV stands for the clinical target volume. And this is typically an isotropic expansion for what we call microscopic extension of disease. So everything we do in radiation therapy is based on a CT scan. Um, sometimes in MRI and in rare instances. Um, and what we know is that what we see on that CT scan in terms of the tumor volume, there may still be cancer cells a millimeter away from that, for example. And so this CTV actually accounts for that. We then perform what's called a PTV or planning target volume. Um, and this is an isotropic expansion to account for what we call setup uncertainty. So even though we have a patient immobilized so that each day we're precise within a couple millimeters, we do know that every day things could be off maybe a millimeter or two millimeters. And so that accounts for that um, potential error. We also have the ability to create what we call an ITV or internal target or tumor volume. And this is basically a volume that can be drawn which accounts for organ or tumor motion. 
So if we think about a lung tumor, if it's in the middle of the lung, as we're breathing, that tumor is actually moving, moving while we're breathing. And so we actually have the ability to do what we call a 4D CAT scan, which actually traces a patient's breathing cycle. And we can actually see how that tumor is moving in all the phases of that breathing cycle. When we then kind of draw out the area that we're targeting, we include that entire area that we see with all of the motion, and we call that an ITV. When it comes to some of the planning techniques, there's a lot of different techniques that we can use for radiation therapy. Um, I'm starting off to explain these in kind of the more simplest form to some of the more complex forms. So in general, when we talk about kind of basic radiation, we are talking about what we call 3D conformal radiation therapy, or 3D CRT. And some of the tenets and basics of that are that we use a CT scan to plan from the anatomy. It allows for multiple different angles that we can use, and we basically kind of create this virtual patient from which we deliver the therapy. So this technique is still widely used um, in the US and, and, and in many other countries as well. Um, and it's commonly used for um, early stage breast cancer patients, if we have a bone metastasis that we're treating, um, for some of the more simplistic things where we don't have a lot of other organs at risk that we need to think about, say, the heart, the lung, the bowel, and so forth. The next most complex form of radiation is called IMRT, which stands for Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy. Um, and basically what this is, is um, what I like to, to teach my residents, is think about you have a target, and then you're gonna look at that target from multiple different angles. But from each of those different angles, you may have different, anat or different other organs that are in the way. So from this angle, you may only see the target from the sides. At another angle, you may see it just in the front. And so intensity modulated radiation therapy allows each beam to kind of see the target in a different way that then when you kind of combine all of that together, you receive a homogeneous dose of radiation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what you can see in this figure here is this is an example of a patient um, probably who had prostate cancer and had their surgery first. And there's five different beams that this picture is depicting. And from each beam, what this map is looking at, we call this a fluence map, you can see that each of these pictures has a very different shape to it. And those shapes are basically the different views that the beam is seeing to deliver the radiation therapy to that area. This allows us a lot of customization based on a specific planning objective. And so what it allows us to do, for example, is I can tell the system to treat the tumor to 50 gray, raise the dose of radiation, but I want you to keep the bladder at, say, 20 gray, even though it's right next to it and touching that organ. And so this type of therapy allows us to do that with a lot of ease. This is just another example of that in a patient with a head and neck cancer. Um, what these different panels here are supposed to uh, uh, simulate are uh, multiple different beam angles. So in this uh, specific example, there's nine of those. And it, this is a common technique used for um, head and neck cancers because these patients have a lot of organs at risk that are all in the area um, adjacent to that, and we want to do a lot of organ sparing. Um, so this is a very common technique used for our head and neck cancer patients as well. Another form of radiation therapy kind of uh, increasing complexity is what we call VMAT, or volumetric modulated arc therapy. And basically, this is what I just showed you with IMRT, except that the machine actually rotates around the patient in a 360-degree arc, and it delivers the radiation therapy the entire time that the gantry is moving around the patient. What's really unique about this therapy is it actually allows for quicker treatment delivery. So sometimes if we have a patient who has a really hard time lying on the table or wearing their mask, um, we might think about this therapy a little bit more because it delivers it a little bit quicker. Um, it also allows for more conformal, uh, more conformality of the moderate doses of radiation therapy, improved dose homogeneity, which basically means that when we look across that target, the dose is essentially the same. But it does have a, um, it, it is at the expense of surrounding more low dose to the surrounding tissues. Um, and so this is an example of an IMRT plan on the left and a VMAT plan on the right. Um, again, this is a patient who had prostate cancer in the past and had their prostate removed. Um, and what you can see here is that the red areas are the high dose of radiation, that's our target. And if you look, they look relatively similar across both. But what you can notice with the IMRT plan here on the left is you get the streaking of moderate doses of radiation out into the other organs, whereas in the VMAT plan on the right, you see that all that's kind of hugging the target a little bit better. Um, so that's kind of one of the differences uh, in these two technologies. 
Um, VMAT now is, has really, I, I would argue, replaced a lot of our IMRT therapies because it's quicker and you again get kind of this more homogeneity of the dose. Um, so this is again widely used um, throughout the country and the world. Brachytherapy is another technique of radiation therapy, and, and at its basics, what this means is placing a radiation source inside or, an, or adjacent to a tumor. It allows for a very rapid dose fall off and maximal sparing of our normal tissues. So because it's being inserted into the body, we don't actually have to go through it from the outside in. And so this is commonly used for tumors and body cavities, a lot of GYN cancers, cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, vaginal cancers. Um, it can also be used for some head and neck cancers like nasopharyngeal cancers or oral tongue cancers. Um, and then it can also be used for tumors that are very close to the surface of the skin. So prostate, um, uh, people have probably heard of prostate seeds before. So this is a form of brachytherapy where we can insert seeds directly into the prostate. Also things like sarcoma, the tongue, the lip, and then uh, the breast as well. Um, so some examples of brachytherapy. So this is actually a patient who had an ocular melanoma. So a melanoma in the back of the eye. Um, and what we can do in conjunction with the ophthalmologist is actually stitch a little radioactive plaque on top of the tumor behind the eye. It delivers the radiation therapy there for a couple days, and then we remove that plaque and the tumor's actually been treated. Um, this is an example of a patient who has cervical cancer, um, and we have uh, these devices here. Um, this particular example is called a tandem and ring. So we actually insert this uh, gray piece directly into, through the cervix into the uterus. We then have this white donut looking shape here that sits outside of the cervix in the vaginal vault and touching the cervix. And through both of these catheters, we're actually able to deliver radiation therapy to the cervix um, without actually getting significant radiation dose to the bladder or the rectum. And this is still um, very commonly used um, throughout the world uh, for cervical cancer treatment and actually is one of the most important parts of curing a patient's cervical cancer. Another form of radiation therapy that people may have heard about is called stereotactic radiosurgery, or um, sometimes it's abbreviated SRS. Um, so this has historically been used to treat brain tumors, and kind of the machine that most people have heard about a little bit more is called Gamma Knife. Um, and this was Gamma Knife was actually the first type of machine uh, to develop or that was developed to deliver stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, with the Gamma Knife treatments, basically what happens is we place a frame onto the patient's head that has a three-dimensional coordinate system. Um, patients then undergo an MRI with that frame on. And then we're actually able to do treatment planning um, and delivery with that frame. And basically what happens is you have 101 different beams that all intersect at that one focal point. So you get a very high dose of radiation at the tumor, but through any given beam path, there's essentially a negligible dose of radiation therapy. Um, this technology has really developed where now we can treat tumors in other sites of the body using the same type of therapy. And we call that stereotactic body radiation therapy, or we abbreviate it SBRT. And this is now commonly used in lung cancers, liver cancers, uh, bone tumors, lots of different types of therapy. Um, and actually what's really exciting about SBRT now um, is it's actually showing uh, a huge impact in patients who have what we call oligometastatic cancers, which means patients who have metastatic disease but maybe only have three to up to seven lesions. And now when we actually give patients stereotactic uh, body radiation therapy to those lesions, what we're actually finding is we're improving the overall survival rates, which is pretty exciting. Um, so this therapy has been so successful that in lung cancer, for example, it's actually been compared head to head in a randomized study with a lobectomy, which has kind of been the gold standard surgery for early stage lung cancer. And the local control outcomes are actually the same with SBRT compared to surgery. And so this is actually starting to uh, potentially replace some of the surgeries that we're doing. Um, one thing I always like to mention um, is CyberKnife. Um, a lot of people have heard about CyberKnife. So this is a brand of a machine that delivers stereotactic radiation therapy. Um, so Georgetown has um, several CyberKnife, many of the other um, uh, uh, radiation oncology centers in the area have this as well. Um, but they did, they've done a lot of marketing, so a lot of people have heard of CyberKnife, but maybe haven't heard of SBRT. So again, it's kind of just the brand of a machine that delivers that. Um, so again, here's a picture of a tumor in the brain. Uh, here's a, an example of an early stage lung cancer um, treated with SBRT. So a couple of basics on radiation biology um, and, and kind of some of the principles um, of that. 
Um, so one is a radiation survival curve. So these, this is a very classic figure that we learn about, um, showing kind of the effect of different types of radiation and their cell kill. So um, on the, the um, x-axis or y-axis here, we have survival in a logarithmic fashion. On the x-axis here, we have increasing doses of radiation therapy. Um, and so what we can see here, what this is supposed to depict is so this line here that I'm using my cursor on is the effect of alpha rays. Um, so what you can see is that alpha rays um, can have a, a, this is kind of their log, logarithmic kill. Um, over here we have x-rays um, as well, and you can see that there's a huge difference between our x-rays, um, which are similar to gamma rays, compared to alpha rays as well. Um, one of the things that we do in radiation therapy, though, is we talk about fractionation. Um, so it's very rare that we give one single dose of radiation, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One is a side effect profile, um, and the other is that we actually can harm our normal organs near that, near that area. So generally what we do is we fractionate radiation. So we give a lot of little doses over a long time period, and then you effectively get the same uh, uh, rate of, or the same number of cell kill with using fractionation. Yet our normal tissues are actually able to respond to this much better. And so kind of the whole rationale again, uh, for fractionation is to take advantage of the slightly improved survival of our normal tissues to smaller doses, and then we amplify that over many treatments. Um, and so this is another picture here, looking at the differences between what we call early responding tissues and tumor tissues and late responding tissues. So tumor, um, as well as uh, cells in our body that have rapid turnover, so things like our hair, our skin, the lining of our GI tract, the lining of our esophagus and our mouth, those are what we call early responding tissues, and so they have an effect um, earlier on in the therapy, um, but then they can heal over time, taking advantage of this kind of improved survival of normal tissues. Whereas our late responding tissues, um, again, are typically not affected early on, but then can be affected much later on. And so these are actually the things that we worry about more in radiation oncology, are what are our long-term effects? Are we causing long-term organ damage for these patients? In general, with radiation biology, we talk about the four R's of fractionated radiation. So the first is repair, the second is reassortment, or some, some textbooks call it redistribution, then reoxygenation and repopulation. We'll touch on each of these very briefly here. So in terms of repair, um, so our healthy cells are actually able to repair the DNA damage that um, is caused by radiation on a daily basis. Um, and so that occurs every day between treatments uh, for a patient. Now sometimes the tumor cells can also undergo repair as well. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we have to fractionate over many days and get to an overall higher dose of radiation therapy. Reassortment, um, actually I think uh, here, so repair. So the DNA is the primary target of radiation. Um, and there's really two different effects of radiation at the DNA level. So the easier one to think about is the direct effect. So radiation can actually come in and damage the DNA directly and cause a double strand break. And so these are actually what we're looking for are these double strand breaks, because if you induce a double strand break, that cell will either die right then or it will die when it actually goes to try to divide into two new cells. And uh, in addition to that, though, we can have what's called single strand breaks, and these are often due to an indirect effect of the radiation. And so what we mean by an indirect effect of radiation is radiation often will interact with something else in the cell. It will kick off a free radical or an oxidant, and then that oxidant will be sitting next to DNA and go and damage part of the DNA. And so that effect often causes, calls, uh, causes what we call single strand breaks. But with single strand breaks, because you have the other component of the DNA there, the DNA strand, those can be repaired over time. And so that's typically kind of what happens. And so in general, again, what we're looking for are double strand breaks are, are really what's key. When we think about um, how many, what is more likely to happen, single strand breaks or double strand breaks, double strand breaks are much more rare. And the reason for that is, again, our DNA has things like histones and protective proteins and all these things that, that try to make it um, a little bit more protected. But again, they do happen cumulatively over the course of radiation therapy. Um, another thing to note is that um, there is a difference between the effect of photon therapy, which again is kind of our regular radiation, 
and, and particle therapy. Um, particle therapy are things like proton radiation, carbon ions. Um, there's a couple other ones out there as well. And so photons often more, more often cause these single strand breaks, whereas particle therapy, because they're bigger, they actually more often cause double strand breaks. Um, but again, cells that, cor correct the, or cells that can correct a DNA double strand break can go on to divide another day again and ultimately repair themselves. When we talk about redistribution, um, one thing that happens is radiation can often induce the cell cycle to arrest and then be in a phase where it can either repair additional damage or where it's not as susceptible to that damage. Um, so again, here's just one of the pathways of how all of that works. Um, so you can have ionizing radi radiation and then it can then go through the ATM and P53 pathways and ultimately cause either cell cycle arrest or apoptosis. Um, in general, the phases of the cell cycle that are most sensitive to radiation therapy are the G2 phase and the mitotic phase. Uh, the G1 phase um, oftentimes is less uh, sensitive to radiation therapy as well as the G0. Um, and so one of the therapies that's out there, people may have heard of, are called checkpoint inhibitors, okay? So checkpoint inhibitors, what they do is they basically break down these checkpoints here allow the cell to continue in the cell cycle so that it does ultimately get into a phase where things are more susceptible to radiation damage or damage to chemotherapy agents as well. And so checkpoint inhibitors have actually proven to be very effective in, in many cancers, and there's a lot of work being done on these as well. Um, again, as I just mentioned, kind of the M phase and the G2 phase are the more um, radiosensitive. And here on the right is just, again, a, a cell survival curve looking at the cell kill in these different phases with the most cell kill seen again in the M and G2 phase, uh, which you can see here. Um, so one of the things that we often do is we do often combine radiation therapy with other modalities that can actually change which part of the cell cycle um, the cancer cells are in. And so this is actually one of the reasons we oftentimes combine chemotherapy with radiation um, because the chemotherapy can actually sensitize the cells to radiation more and the way they do it oftentimes is by pushing that cell into a different, more sensitive phase of the cell cycle. Reoxygenation. So following radiation therapy, um, tumors can reoxygenate. Um, and what we know is that tumors that have a more oxygenated environment, radiation therapy is more effective in those environments than in a hypoxic environment. Um, now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and the main one, as I kind of showed you from a couple slides ago, is that radiation induces these free radicals well, the most common free radical that we can have in our body comes up from water. Um, so in general, um, oxygenated uh, areas are much more susceptible to radiation therapy damage. And so again, you can see that here depicted on these curves. So um, a hypoxic environment tends to be a little bit more radio resistant, whereas an aerated environment tends to have more cell kill. The other area where this um, is very pertinent is um, with tumors and their blood supply. So tumors, as they grow bigger, oftentimes outgrow their blood supply. So you will develop actually necrotic or hypoxic areas inside the tumor. And oftentimes those areas can be more difficult to actually kill than the parts of the cell uh, or the parts of the tumor that uh, are well oxygenated. Um, and so this is something else that we think about is how can we modulate that a little bit? How can we improve blood flow to areas to help make the radiation therapy more effective? Um, another thing that's out there are different things, and I've alluded to this already, um, but radiation modifiers. Um, and so there's a couple different ways that we can modify things um, uh, or, or induce a, a modification with the radiation. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's things that we can do to sensitize the tumor to, to radiation. Um, and so these are um, some uh, classic curves here in radiation where we look at tumor control over dose. So the higher the dose of radiation we give, the less the, uh, or the more the cell kill, um, or tumor control, meaning the more effect of the radiation. Um, I think this graph's a little bit counterintuitive with that. Um, and then we also have a curve here for our normal tissues. So what you can often see is that if we increase the dose of radiation, we're gonna get more tumor cell kill, but we're also gonna get more, more normal tissue cell kill. And so oftentimes what we're looking at is how can we give that same dose of radiation and get better tumor control with either the same or less tissue damage. Um, and so that's what's depicted here um, in, in this graph here. 
Um, alternatively, another way that we can look at it is can we give a radiation modifier that causes radio protection of our normal tissues? Um, so instead of moving that curve, that shifting that to the left, can we shift it to the right? And so there's been a lot of work done on radio protection modifiers. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these studies haven't panned out so well because when they protect the normal tissues, they sometimes also protect the tumor a little bit. Um, but there was a, a big one that we used to use in head and neck cancers um, uh, to help protect from uh, what we call mucositis. Um, unfortunately, it's really fallen out of favor because it, it, um, for a variety of reasons, it, it wasn't always well tolerated either. Um, but again, so this is something that, that people are always looking at. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in this arena, but more often from a um, nuclear disaster type of viewpoint. So what about some of the different radiation targets that we can use um, to help modify uh, or radiosensitize? Um, so these are some of the different targets that are often uh, looked at, and many of these targets have also already become um, active drugs that we use in combination with radiation. So growth factor receptors like EGFR receptors, the VEGF receptor, um, so this is uh, one of the drugs that targets this is called cetuximab. One of the drugs that targets this is bevacizumab. Um, some of the different DNA repair proteins, again, transcription factors, signal transduction proteins. Um, there's a, a new drug targeting the PI3 kinase pathway called PICRE, um, which is being used now um, in, in patients. Um, in addition to that, we can look at multi-target inhibition, so looking at chaperone proteins. Um, microenvironment, again, angiogenesis and vasculature. Um, a big area that people are working on is epigenetic modification. Um, so Temidar, which is a drug that's commonly used in glioblastomas, um, kind of harnesses some of this. Um, and then in addition to that, there's other radiation-inducible targets, which also have been looked at as well. Um, so this is just one very small example, um, and this um, is an older slide, so to be honest, this is probably much bigger now. Um, but just looking at all the different um, targets from the EGFR family, so EGFR is, again, epidermal growth factor. Um, and you can see here um, there's many targets that are already in uh, clinical use. As I mentioned, bevacizumab, cetuximab, uh, Tarceva, um, and many, many more um, that, again, aren't even depicted um, here as well. Um, so when we look at, well, what are some of the issues for target or agent development? Um, so one of the big things is the mechanism. So again, we have to look at the specific cell types, um, or is it due to a specific condition, uh, the cancer? We have to look at the method of targeting, so looking at antibody therapy versus small molecules versus gene therapy. Again, there's challenges with each of these different approaches. Antibodies, for example, often don't penetrate the blood-brain barrier. So sometimes when we give these therapies, we're not really protecting the brain, for example. And then we certainly also have to look at the therapeutic ratio. So are we want to kill more of the tumor as opposed to more of our normal cells as well? Um, again, one of the really exciting areas, which I think most people uh, really are, are, are well aware of now, are some of the immunomodulatory agents or some of the immunotherapy. Um, so these are combined very well with radiation, and then in some patients we can develop what's called the abscopal effect, which I'll show a slide of in a minute here. Um, there's a variety of different types of agents, so PD, uh, PD-L1 inhibitors um, and, and many others. Um, so one of the, there's a lot of these drugs on commercials now, like Keytruda and so forth, and uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting time because uh, we're really seeing some, some nice outcomes uh, in patients with these agents. So what the abscopal effect is, so this is actually, um, this was kind of the seminal case report um, from New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and basically what this was, was a patient who had metastatic melanoma. Uh, they were receiving uh, immunotherapy. And what happened was that they developed this metastasis here, kind of in the paraspinal area, that was treated with radiation using that SBRT approach I mentioned earlier. And what was very surprising is that when they gave radiation while the patient was on this immunotherapy, even though they only targeted this area, all of the patient's other areas of known disease actually got smaller. Um, and so this is what's called the abscopal effect, where you essentially get this effect of cancer shrinkage in other parts of the body that never had radiation therapy. Uh, so this was a, a really exciting thing, and, and a lot of people are doing a lot of work in this arena as well. Um, so moving on now to radiation therapy and kind of the clinical practice, just to, to give everyone a flavor of, of what, it, what it entails. Uh, so again, our, our general two goals in radiation therapy are to either cure the cancer, uh, certainly if it's localized and not metastatic, or in the metastatic setting, uh, we often have a huge role in palliating different symptoms. 
So actually about half of the patients that we treat um, on a day-to-day -day basis are for palliation. Um, and so again, this can be when cancer is disseminated to multiple organs that are causing any sort of bothersome symptoms for the patient. Um, so that's uh, some kind of the classic examples are bone metastases where patients can have pain. Um, sometimes they can have a lung lesion that's causing collapse of their lung tissue. So we may treat that uh, areas that are bleeding from tumor as well are some of the, the classic indications. Um, so again, uh, when we talk about uh, what types of cancer, so, so really um, any solid tumor um, uh, can be treated with radiation therapy. Um, in general, radiation doesn't have such a large role in some of the tumors or some of the cancers like leukemias. Uh, there is still a role in some lymphomas, but not all. Um, but most solid tumors uh, at some point do have radiation therapy as part of their care. Uh, so the oncology team, um, radiation oncology uh, really fits in with a whole oncology team. So cancer, as many people probably know, is really a multidisciplinary disease. Um, multiple different types of specialties come together to treat a single cancer patient. And then that also includes different things like social workers, nutritionists, uh, survivorship, um, a lot of specialties that kind of come in together uh, from a, to treat an oncology patient. Um, when we actually see a patient, um, whether they're curative or palliative, but, but certainly when we see a new patient, the general idea is to develop what we call a multimodality plan. Um, and oftentimes this may include surgery, radiation, some sort of systemic therapy, but there's also sometimes some other local therapies that we may incorporate as well, like focal ablation techniques, um, like high, fo uh, high frequency focused ultrasound, um, or different uh, ways of drug delivery. Um, radiation therapy treatment is a process, and so I'll kind of walk you through that very briefly here. So it starts off with a consultation with a radiation oncologist. Um, if the radiation oncologist deems the patient to be a candidate for radiation therapy, the next step is to then undergo what's called a CT simulation, or what we call a planning session. Um, once that's performed, we then actually take those CT images, and that's how we create the radiation plan, and we transfer those images to a treatment planning system. Um, we have the ability at that time to fuse outside images like a PET scan or an MRI scan to help do our delineation of the targets. Um, we then undergo contouring, and again, I'll kind of show a couple pictures of each of these steps where um, as the physician, you actually will draw what we, the areas that you want to target, um, what I mentioned before, GTV, CTV, PTV. But then we also contour out our normal structures. So what are the areas we want to avoid with radiation, the heart, the lung, the parotid glands? Um, then that a radiation plan is created that's all customized for that patient. And there's a whole field um, of people called dosimetrists that actually help do this. Um, then as the physician, we evaluate that plan. That plan is also evaluated by our medical physicists. And then once all of that's approved, the, the plan is actually transferred to our treatment machines, and then the patient undergoes the actual treatment delivery. Um, so this is an example of a CT scan um, of one of our head and neck patients. Um, so this is a, a snapshot of what our planning uh, software looks like. Um, so this was a patient who had a floor of mouth cancer, uh, who had surgery. Um, and what you can see here is what's in this red area here was actually our target or our GTV. Um, and then what you can easily appreciate here are some of the, all the other kind of things that were contoured out here. Um, the mandible, um, the parotid glands, the brainstem, the spinal cord. So all of this work is done for every single patient. Um, depending on the disease site we're treating, this can sometimes take 15 minutes or sometimes it can take up to an hour even. Um, so moving forward, so now I thought I would go through a little bit of the, um, am I missing a slide or no? I'm good? Okay. Um, so we would, I thought I would go through a couple patient presentations for some of our most common diseases that we treat. Um, so again, this first patient here, um, is a 55-year-old female with a new lump in her left breast. Um, she underwent a mammogram um, for part of her workup and had a suspicious abnormality that was seen. She had a biopsy performed, which was consistent with infiltrating ductal carcinoma, which is the most common type of breast cancer. Um, and the patient had no family history of breast cancer um, at, at the time of her diagnosis. So the first thing we have to develop is a treatment plan. Um, so for breast cancer, one of the first steps is to undergo surgery. Um, and so patients can choose to either have a mastectomy or what we call breast conserving therapy, which consists of a lumpectomy plus radiation. Um, a mastectomy certainly is a much bigger surgery for patients, um, but there are randomized studies done for appropriate patients comparing a mastectomy versus 
lumpectomy plus radiation. And the cure rates with both of those therapies are the same. And then the woman can have the advantage of maintaining her breast uh, and her cosmesis. Um, so the patient in this scenario selects breast conservation. So she undergoes a lumpectomy as well as a sentinel lymph node biopsy where they basically inject a dye into the breast. They then wait for a brief period of time and then that will track to the lymph nodes in the axilla or the armpit. Um, they do that with both a blue dye as well as a radio tracer. Um, and then at the time of the surgery, they actually are able to find those lymph node areas and they remove those lymph nodes that actually kind of light up with the radio tracer and the dye. Um, at the time of her surgery, pathology revealed a three centimeter tumor and four axillary lymph nodes that were positive for cancer. So this patient then receives chemotherapy and then returns to radiation oncology to start her radiation uh, process. So the first thing that we have to do is actually determine well, what type of radiation should we give her? Um, so in this case, it would be external beam radiation. And we have kind of three different techniques we can use, proton radiation, photon therapy, or electron therapy. Um, for some patients, we can also use brachytherapy, which I mentioned. And so there's a difference between sealed and unsealed sources. Um, this is an example of a brachytherapy plan for a breast cancer patient. Um, and what happens is all these catheters go through the breast and then through the kind of this white tail you can see here, we're able to connect that to a small radiation machine, which then delivers radiation through there. Um, this technique really isn't done in our country at all, um, but, but I, I thought I would mention it here. Um, it's done a little bit more in Europe. Um, so um, in this case, we, we choose uh, photon therapy for this patient. And so the patient undergoes their CT simulation. Um, so you can see an example of kind of the breast tissue here. Um, and then we actually have to draw out where we want to deliver radiation as well as set um, what we call our radiation fields. Um, and so what may be a little bit difficult to see um, is there's some purple lines here which indicate what we call our tangent field from radiation. And so one comes from the medial side here, one comes from the lateral side, and we essentially sandwich all of the breast tissue kind of into that area. One of the things you can note though, is this is the heart here, and you can actually see that, well, part of the heart is in this field here. And so that's something that we would work through in the planning process to minimize any radiation dose to the heart. In this specific scenario, since this woman had some positive lymph nodes in her armpit, we also include what we call a supraclavicular field, where we're actually treating the supraclavicular lymph nodes, which are known draining lymph nodes um, of the breast tissue. And all of that then kind of fits together where we don't have any overlap of what we call the supraclavicular field and the tangent field. So once we've set those fields and drawn our contours, we then create a radiation plan. Um, so again, this is an example of one of those plans. And so the red kind of squiggly line here is what we call our 100% isodose line. So that's the amount we want in our target. And then as you kind of go down here, you see lower do lowering doses of radiation therapy. And there's various ways that we can modulate this to make sure that we're getting the highest dose that we want to in the appropriate area. Um, once that's done, we then are able to deliver the treatment. And so one of the things that we actually do when we're delivering radiation therapy is we actually will take an image on the treatment machine to make sure we're lining everything up correctly on that day. Um, so this is an example here of what we call a port image where we take an x-ray when the patient's actually laying on the treatment table in the position. And we're actually showing that, so um, this yellow box here is kind of the field. And then we have these, this blue line here, which shows, so this is actually kind of the field that's being delivered. And so this is actually the portal image of that patient. And we're actually showing that this shape is exactly the way we planned it for the radiation therapy. We also do that to make sure that we're in the right area. Um, so for breast cancer patients, it's a little bit easier, but some other parts of the body, um, say if, if we're treating the spine area, for example, we need to know exactly which vertebral bodies we're treating each day. And so we're able to take these images on the treatment machine to ensure the exact location. Um, another example um, is a patient with prostate cancer. So this is a 54-year-old male who has an elevated PSA or um, prostate-specific antigen on routine exam. The patient has no prior medical problems and has a biopsy performed, which shows prostate cancer with uh, what's called the Gleason score of six, which means it's a lower risk prostate cancer. Um, so again, when we think about develop, developing a treatment plan for this patient, this patient has a lot of different options actually. So they could undergo surgery with a prostatectomy. They could undergo a surgery and radiation if they have some high-risk features seen at the time of surgery. Or they could actually undergo radiation therapy alone. 
Um, and in this particular patient, they may be a candidate for brachytherapy or prostate seeds, external beam radiation, or actually a combination. Or they could even get radiation and hormonal therapy. So there's a lot of different options for this patient, and we have to weigh all those options, both in terms of the pros and cons in terms of curing their cancer, as well as the patient's own desires and, and what they want. So this is an example of a prostate seed implant for one of our patients. Um, so it's a little bit difficult. So this is an ultrasound image. Um, the ultrasound probe is actually in the rectum, so we call this a transrectal ultrasound. Um, what is in gray here that I'm circling is actually the prostate gland, um, and then kind of the uh, whiter tissue around that are some of the supporting tissues and so forth. Um, so what happens in a prostate seed implant is all under ultrasound guidance. We kind of delineate the prostate. We then put catheters into the prostate through the perineum, um, uh, so basically through the skin. Um, those catheters are hollow on the inside, and then through those, we can actually put seeds directly into the prostate. And so each of these green dots here is supposed to simulate a seed. And what you can notice is that there's kind of this area here in the middle that we don't see any of those. And the reason for that is this is where the urethra sits, which is, again, the tube from the bladder to kind of the outside. And so we want to avoid that area with the seeds. And so you can see we can actually get a very nice dose of radiation to the entire gland, well, we actually are able to avoid the urethra um, and spare that. Um, this is an example of a patient who gets um, external beam radiation therapy with that VMAT technique, as I mentioned before. So um, what's in red and blue here is the prostate um, and that PTV that I talked about. Um, and then you can see the isodose lines that are really tight around the prostate with a lower, uh, very low dose that kind of streaks out uh, into the femoral heads. What you can see here is it's very tight. So this, what's delineated in yellow here is the bladder, um, and it's very tight around that. And then what's in brown here is the rectum, and you can see that we're getting, uh, keeping the high dose away from the rectum as well. Um, with prostate cancer, we also have the ability to do what's called image-guided radiation therapy. Um, and so what we can do is implant three gold fiducial markers into the prostate, which then we can use to triangulate the exact location of the prostate on a daily basis. So believe it or not, for the prostate, depending on how full the bladder is in the front and how full the rectum is in the back, the prostate's actually been shown to move up to two centimeters in any given direction. So we have to account for that. And so how do we triangulate that exact location? Um, so again, the classic way to do this is by implanting these gold fiducial markers into the prostate, which then just stay with the patient for the rest of their life. Um, another cool technology that's available is called Calypso. And what these are are radio frequency beacons. And so we can implant those into the prostate. And then while the patient's getting treated, uh, we have a radio frequency detector that kind of sits over top of the prostate or over the patient. Uh, it's it's kind of like a, a, just a little sheet here. Um, and that can actually tell us and track where the prostate is during the entire therapy. So if, for example, the patient passes gas while they're on the table and the prostate moves, we can actually stop the treatment realign the patient, and then continue with their therapy. Um, so this is a picture um, of, of these, mark, these gold fiducial markers. Um, so this is, again, a type of image that we do on the treatment machine each day before the patient gets treated. Um, and so what's on the left here and here are the images that are acquired at the time of the planning session. And then what's on the right here and here are the images that we actually took that day before treatment. And so what we do is we try to make sure that these, um, these, they're in green here, are in the exact same shape as what we see that day for the treatment. Another cool thing that we're able to do actually on the treatment machines is also do a mini CAT scan. Um, and so how that can be beneficial, again, for our prostate patients is we can actually track a patient's bladder filling to see if it's full enough. Um, and so in the case of prostate cancer, sometimes a piece of bowel may be sitting right on top of the prostate. Well, if we treat the patient with their bladder full, it pushes that piece of bowel out of the way so it doesn't receive radiation. And so again, this is a picture of a patient um, who had, had their cone beam CT. And so what you see in the bigger picture here is actually, again, this is the patient at the time of their planning session, and what's in yellow is the bladder. And then what's harder to see is where I'm inside kind of this area I'm um, uh, doing a square with, is this is actually how the patient looks today. And so what you can see on the sagittal image here is that the bladder should be this yellow, but what you actually see is it's much, much smaller today than it was the day of the planning session. And so the, in this example, we can actually have the patient get off of the treatment table, 
drink a little bit more water, fill their bladder, and then we would go on to treat them once their bladder is actually full. And so part of these types of advances are, are really the, the reason that we're able to be, have better outcomes now compared to what we used to be able to do in the past. Um, so again, delivering the therapy. Um, and then, so, so the question is then, is, is it all just that easy? Does radiation work every time, you know? Um, and so again, we do know that there are side effects from radiation. Um, so this is essentially normal tissue toxicity. And as I briefly mentioned, we can have both acute effects and late effects. And I'll, I'll give a couple examples of those in a second. Um, we do know that um, cancer cells can sometimes have stem cell depletion, uh, as well as our body can. Um, we can also induce chronic oxidative damage, sometimes some vascular destruction, fibrosis, and more. But again, radiation is really dosed to our normal tissues and not the tumor. So we're oftentimes limited in the dose that we can deliver safely by our normal tissues. And that oftentimes is really what defines kind of the total dose that we're delivering. So a good example of this is pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so this is a very old example. This is not what we would do anymore. Um, it, it's hard to see here, but this is actually from 1992. Um, so this was a patient who had a lung cancer, and we treated this huge area with radiation, which we would never do today. And what you can see is um, over 10 years later, the patient has damage to the lung, pulmonary fibrosis, in exactly this shape as it was delivered at that time. And so now we know a lot more about the pathways of, of, uh, in the body that actually result in either uh, radiation pneumonitis or ultimately lead to pulmonary fibrosis. And in particular, we look at TGF uh, beta, um, and this is the, the uh, molecular marker, which, which correlates with the, these risks and so forth. Um, another um, example of some long-term uh, side effects that patients can have are lymphedema. Um, and again, this can be due to vessel damage. And basically what can happen after radiation therapy is you can develop some sclerosis of the lymphatic channels, um, which can overall result in a slowing of how uh, the fluid is moving throughout the body. Um, and patients can ultimately develop chronic lymphedema um, of the extremities uh, from radiation therapy. Um, again, when we think about this a lot in breast cancer, um, it oftentimes is more related to their extent of, of uh, axillary dissection as opposed to radiation, but we certainly do know that radiation contributes to that as well. Um, an example of a short-term side effect is what we call mucositis or inflammation of the mucosa. So this is something that we typically see in our head and neck cancer patients. Um, they can cause them a lot of pain, can cause them difficulties with eating. Um, and this is one of the main side effects that we have to manage in, in our head and neck cancer patients. And so sometimes what you can see is that you can actually develop kind of stem cell depletion um, of the mucosal lining that can take um, several weeks to actually improve. So what are some of the advances in radiation oncology? What are some of the, what's some of the future? Um, so again, I'd say there's a bio, bio, biology component. So how can we use radiation to induce targets for other agents? Um, we need to develop better radiation sensitizers and protectors. And then we still need to do more work combining radiation with other targeted drugs and develop hopefully some more synergistic effects. Um, from a physics viewpoint, so even though we've done a lot of work on improved targeting with our imaging, we are always still looking to improve this and improving our delivery methods. Um, something that, that also is always being worked on is how can we make our treatments quicker for patients? Because the less time they have to lay on the table, the less likely they are to move. Um, and then some of the clinical things, so translating some of the exciting laboratory findings that, that people are working on into the clinic and developing uh, for more clinician scientists. And then I've also added here, because again, we usually get a lot of questions about this, but how can we synergize radiation, again, with some of the immunotherapy agents as well? Because we know that radiation therapy can also stimulate the immune system. Um, one of the new types of radiation that's available in the area, both in Baltimore and then um, also down in DC, is proton radiation. Um, so I want to take a brief moment to talk about why proton radiation is a little bit different than our regular radiation, because this is definitely an advancement. So our regular radiation is depicted here in the blue. Um, so it starts off in the body um, a little bit weaker, gets strong a couple centimeters in, and then it just gets weaker and weaker and weaker as it passes through the body. Proton therapy is a little bit different in that it starts off in the body uh, weaker, it gets strong where we tell it to, and then it stops. Um, and so one of the main benefits of proton radiation um, when they stop is that we can actually avoid all of this excess dose of radiation that we just can't modulate with our regular therapy. 
Um, and so an example of, of what this can mean for patients, this is an example of one of our breast cancer patients. So on the right here is our regular radiation. Um, and so you can see the, the breast tissues outlined here in orange. You can see the red area, which is the high dose of radiation, and then kind of lower doses as we go uh, into the greens. On the left here is a proton therapy plan. And so what's very easy to see in this example is that we're actually avoiding a bunch of low dose of radiation to the heart with proton radiation than we are compared to our photon therapy. The other thing that's very hard to see is that there's these tiny gray circles here, and these are actually our coronary vessels. Um, and so what we can see is that we're actually sparing three of the four coronary vessels completely with proton therapy, which we're not doing with our regular radiation. And we know in this particular example that radiation is a risk factor for heart disease, just like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, but it's something we can't take away in the future. And so here's just kind of that subtraction plan as well. Um, so again, we have our, our protein center up in Baltimore. Um, it's, a, it's a regional resource to um, a lot of other providers in the area. So we actually um, used to be partnered with Georgetown, um, the Innova Hospitals in Northern Virginia, uh, and many other centers. Um, and they all come together to help treat patients from their practices um, at our proton center as well. Um, so again, take home messages. Um, so radiation is a uh, tool used in cancer therapy. Um, it still has a huge place in, in cancer therapy. It works by causing DNA damage, which can ultimately lead to cell death. But again, our tumor cells aren't able to repair that damage, whereas our regular cells are. Uh, the effects of radiation can really be altered by a lot of things, including physical factors, physiologic factors, fractionation drugs, and many other variables. Um, radiation can also cause complications. And then a little plug that radiation is also very interesting still. So any questions? Perhaps you can comment on your new procedure for the breast cancer patients. Sure, yeah. So, um, so at the University of Maryland, we've um, recently developed, um, and it's gone through FDA clearance and testing, uh, a new radiation machine called the Gamma Pod, which is all specifically designed around breast cancer. Um, and so what's unique about the Gamma Pod is it actually enables us to deliver that type of radiation that I called stereotactic body radiation to the breast. Um, which historically we really weren't able to do because with the breast being an external organ, um, it can move around a little bit in space. Um, it moves with our breathing, right? As we breathe, our chest moves up and down. And so there are a lot of barriers to, develop, to delivering that type of radiation before, um, before the, the gamma pod was developed. Um, and so what's really exciting is it's a really allowing us to deliver higher doses of radiation in a shorter time frame. So it's actually making therapy more convenient for patients. So instead of, say, taking four weeks to deliver the radiation, we're able to deliver it in five treatments for, for appropriate patients. And then we actually are ha we'll have some clinical trials open in the next month or two. Where we're actually going to look at changing the paradigm of how breast cancer treatment is done and to deliver the radiation first, followed by the surgery. Um, and what we've done in some preliminary work is actually shown that we actually are able to get rid of some of the breast tumors with the radiation alone. So that's a, a very exciting uh, clinical trial that we'll have open in the near future. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, I'm wondering uh, if radiation has some effects on the protein or the uh, cell organelle or some other effects. Only uh, the, the DNA damage is the so effects of radiation. I'm wondering there there are a lot, I'm wondering are there uh, if there are uh, some research or many literature about that or something. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So um. In general, um. There's not thought to be any effect to say the other organelles um in in the cell uh, from radiation. Um. You know it doesn't disrupt say the cell membrane uh, per se. Um, it doesn't affect, you know, the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, we do know there can be some degree of an effect sometimes in mitochondria, especially because mitochondria um, have some, you know, some DNA as well. Um, but again, when we then combine radiation with some of these other drugs, then there is a synergy where there can be an effect. So again, if you have a, a, um, a receptor inhibitor, um, that then could have an effect when you combine those therapies together. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. 
Thank you, Doctor. This is a very interesting talk. And apparently, I heard about the proton therapies almost every day while I'm driving here. So it's a lot of advertisement on the radio, apparently. So can you brief us with some of the current development with the core therapy for the proton therapy that uh, combined with the other kind of therapy, like the cisplatin treatments and mm -hmm. the carboplatin treatments, and also as well as the uh, cancer target drugs? For, especially for like breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so proton therapy um, can be combined with chemotherapy drugs. Um, it can be combined with hyperthermia, which is kind of like a, a heat therapy that improves blood flow. Um, it's, it's safe to combine with, um, I'm not aware of any kind of chemotherapy or immunotherapy drug that it's not safe to combine with. Um, we have done, I mean, I've personally treated many patients with concurrent chemotherapy and protons or concurrent um, hyperthermia. Um, and again, the idea is kind of about synergizing these effects to get the best kind of tumor cell kill um, while, while uh, minimizing damage to the healthy tissues. Um, and so we are seeing some exciting outcomes when we are combining proton therapy with some of these other, other agents. Um, for certain tumors, um, we do know that proton therapy can slightly improve cure rate. So the classic example is a chordoma which is a, a bone tumor of the, the base of skull. Um, so, so I think there's gonna be some exciting um, outcomes seen in the near future, especially as proton centers become a little bit more common in our country. Yep, yeah, so, um, yeah, so it can be used um, in brain tumors. Um, we uh, use breast tumors, um, prostate cancer. So, so essentially any cancer that we treat with radiation we have the ability to use proton therapy in as well. So. Okay, we'll be moving on, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Olaku. He was uh, educated in England. He's a member of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He then came to the US and got a master's degree in public health at Oregon State University. And currently, he's in the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis in the Office of Cancer Complementary and Alternative Medicine. So we've had several people sign up and see the tumor boards and the case reports. And today, he's bringing you the case reports. Thank you, Dr. Moody. Uh, good evening, everybody. We're going to just go briefly about case reports. We'll be out of here very quickly. So what are the objectives? Give it brief background of case reports. How can case reports be used or in what ways have they been used? Describe several case reports so that you have an idea what they look like and what uh, outline some pertinent information of what a good case report should look like. This is one definition of case report. A case report is a formal summary of a unique patient and his or her illness, including the presenting signs and symptoms, diagnostic studies, treatment costs, and outcome. Some historical background, uh, probably the oldest example of preserved medical literature containing clinical cases is a text from uh, Egyptian antiquity papyrus. This was around 1600 BC, and some people believe that this were uh, rewritten from text some centuries before that time. Among these were 48 cases discussing injuries of all disorders of the head and the upper torso. Case reports usually uh, have individuals who have played a significant role in the history of case reports. So this case reports are named after them. For example, we have what we call the Hippocratic case histories. These are usually retrospective accounts uh, that describes only clinically relevant findings. And these case reports contain both mental and physical findings um, about the patients. And really, do they include the complaints of the patient or the patient's versions of the complaints are usually absent. Now we have what we call the Galenic case, case reports. The, the, what Galen introduced was a conversational tone into the case reports, and he usually places himself, uh, he placed himself in the first person, being an active agent in the case description. He described his working day, his doubts, his tentative diagnosis, 
and his interactions with other physicians as the disease unfolds. In the Middle Ages, it appeared as if uh, Western medicine was dormant. Around the same time, there was a, a florescence of medical literature from the Islamic world. And this case reports were similar to what Hippocrates and Galen, uh, uh, the style in which they used. Around in the 17th and 18th centuries, case reports still adhere to uh, the conversational tone of Galen, but there was more emphasis on the patient's subjective experience. Around the same time, physicians or authors uh, were dramatic in the way they wrote case re reports because they wanted to heighten the narrative tension and degrees of physician involvement with suffering subjects. Case titles were more appealing, for example, a girl three years old who remained a quarter of an hour underwater without drowning appeared in a case report in Philosophical Transactions in 1739. In the 19th century, case reports dealt less with patient subjective accounts of their illnesses. Uh, there was a more focus on technical terms, so more medical terminology was used, and the texts were organized into sections. Uh, for example, demographic details of the patient and outline of the clinical course of events. In the area of cancer, the history is similar to what we have in case reports in general. And Myelogenesec describes case reports as the first line of evidence where everything begins. So like I said earlier, you know, the, the um, Cancer case, case reports had a similar historical background uh, like other case reports. Uh, but however, these reports were the first recorded incurable tumors of the breast. Case reports can play uh, several roles. For example, uh, you have recognition and description of new disease. In 1999 in New York, uh, New York uh, a City, you had um, West Nile encephalitis was described from case reports. Another area that case reports play an important role is detection of drug side effects. This could be adverse or beneficial. A significant percentage of drug retractions are usually due to case reports. Uh, sildenafil is a drug that was initially designed to treat hypertension. But during the course of the studies, side effects uh, allow the uh, 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 show that the drug can be used to treat erectile dysfunction, which is what is licensed to treat today. Uh, there was an association um, between depression and smoking cessation. As a result of that association, antidepressants are used today to treat um, nicotine. Uh, uh, I mean, to treat. Um, uh, nicotine withdrawal symptoms. Case reports could be useful in doing, uh, looking at the study of mechanism of disease. For example, looking at a family history led to the uh, uh, detection of um, maternally inherited diabetes associated with deafness. Case reports are very important in medical education and audit. For example, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, have case reports in the journal every week. It can be also important in recognition of rare manifestation of disease, and it definitely has impact on health policy. The latest is the uh, e-cigarettes, and the deaths that have been associated with it has led to some states in this country and even around the world changing policy around uh, e-cigarettes. So case reports can be uh, used to describe new disease. Um, initially, it started as conversation between medical colleagues uh, that ultimately became the origin of journals. And case reports of melanoma were described by Hippocrates and Rufus of Ephesus. In January 1832, Thomas Hodgkin reported six cases in London, which two of which 
uh, what we know today as Hodgkin's lymphoma. 1957, Dennis Bucket described a tumor that presented as a growth in the angle of the jaw of the African children. And uh, in 1990, Fassett and colleagues described two patients with a new type of lymphoma called hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. So we'll go to describe some of these case reports. This is a breast metastasis from primary lung adenocarcinoma in a young woman. Uh, this is a 29-year-old lady, non-smoking nurse, who presented with a three-week history of dry cough to the hospital. CT scan and chest x-ray revealed collapse uh, in the right middle lobe of the lung. There was fluid collection on the right side and enlarged lymph nodes in the mediastinum and right hilum. And that's the collapse, that's the fluid, and around here you have the lymph nodes. On physical examination, a small mass was noted in the upper outer filled quadrant of her right breast. However, there were no nodes palpable in the axilla and the cervical chain lymph nodes. Mammography did not reveal any suspicious images. However, ultrasonography picked up hypoechoic solid nodule 11.6 by 6.6 .6 by 8.9 millimeters in the right breast. And this was subsequently biopsied. And you can see it here. Bronchoscopy reveals submucosal infiltration causing uh, about 50% obstruction of the right middle low bronchus. At the time of the bronchoscopy, the biopsy was taken. And based on all the information that they gathered at the time, the differential diagnosis was that maybe there was a primary breast tumor with lung. Uh, and pleural metastasis, or that there were two independent primary tumors. Cytological um, specimens were stained, and that suggested a diagnosis of adenocarcinoma. Well, so, if tissues were taken from the breast and from the uh, from the lung. Both biopsies after staining revealed infiltration by adenocarcinoma. However, there was no evidence of in situ carcinoma in the breast specimen. Immunohistochemical staining of the lung and breast specimen revealed uh, reactivity with AI1, A3, CK7, and TTF1, and Napsin A. Uh, but however, it lacked expression of cytokeratin 20, P63, ER progesterone receptor, and HER2 new and GATA3. So this is the breast, and this is from the lungs. Uh, so there was no infiltration of the ducts in the breast. Um, this is also the breast, this is the lungs, this is just staining from, um, and this is also from the breast and the lungs. This is the GATA3, it was negative there. So the epidermal growth factor receptor mutations uh, were also negative. And having looked at all the evidence, the histological and immunohistochemical staining was strongly consistent with metastasis to the breast from the primary lung adenocarcinoma. She started treatment with cisplatin and pemetrexate. And after initial response, uh, the disease progressed, and a second line of therapy, uh, Axel, was used. However, due to deterioration in her clinical condition, a third line was not feasible. Um, she continued palliative support, and unfortunately, she passed away. Overall, survival was 20 months. This is a case, excellent response to nivolumab and nivolumab in metastatic gastroesophageal junction squamous carcinoma. A patient, 50-year-old male, presented with a history of weight loss, 50-pound weight loss, fatigue, and difficulty swallowing solid foods. Uh, initial imaging showed um, a 
a mass extending from the top of the gastric folds to the body of the stomach with multiple lymph nodes nearby about five centimeters in size. And this is um, the mass there. And this is an ulcerated view of the same mass. Biopsy revealed the high grade carcinoma with glandular neuroendocrine and squamous differentiation. And again, there was stain for, uh, for tumor markers, expressed AUI1883, synaptophysin P40, and CDX2, and did not express HER2. He also had a 9 millimeter liver metastasis, an MRI. Treatment was begun with Dr. Uh, with a modified docetaxel, cisplatin, and fluorouracil. And the Foundation One genomic alterations um, demonstrated these gene locations, which were not actionable. Molecular markers, PDL1 and microcellulite instability were negative, and tumor mutation body was low. He completed these cycles of DCF and was switched to porphyry. Um, because disease progressed and patient also had extreme fatigue from DCF. Despite showing the initial response to Fulfiri on imaging, uh, it was held after six cycles due to severe nausea, vomiting, and dehydration. He had multiple endoscopies, including um, which they also had balloon dilatation and liquid nitrogen cryotherapy for a near complete uh, gastroesophageal junction obstruction. Eventually, as the disease was progressing, the patient had to have a esophageal stent placed. He also had a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy because he could not tolerate any eating by mouth. And CT imaging showed worsening metastatic disease to the liver. However, as a result of the Checkmate 32 uh, trial, the unique squamous histology of this patient's cancer and the recent successes of PD-1 inhibition in other squamous carcinomas of the skin and head and neck. Treatment was switched off-label to ipilimumab and nivolumab in December of 2017. Um, because the patient was very weak, um, they decided to give two cycles of a reduced dose uh, of the checkpoint inhibitors, and then when it demonstrated good tolerance, they increased the dose slightly. At the same time, he received 14 radiation treatments of, to the GEG junction, uh, GEG for obstruction. Uh, over the next several months, he began to feel better. Stent was removed, scan showed improvement, and um, the GEG mass and metastatic hepatic lesions improved. Subsequently, treatment was modified to monthly maintenance of nivolumab at a fixed dose starting in May 2018. And by June, he could eat without vomiting and was able to return back to full time work. His pet tube was removed in July, and the scan done later that month showed resolution in the GEG and abdominal lymph nodes and near total resolution of the hepatic metastasis. He showed incredible improvement on the treatment, and the main adverse effect was mild thyroiditis. CT scan November 2018 showed resolution of all viable, I mean, visible disease, and PET scan of 2019 was negative for the uptake of FDP, FDG isotope at all sites of disease. Patient supposed to, uh, will be maintained on nivolumab until the end of 2019. And so this was the uh, PET CT before uh, some of the metastasis liver, and this is the stomach disease, and we can see on the other side that it's cleared up. This is a solitary brain metastasis rare initial presentation of prostate cancer. 59-year-old male seen in the AR with acute headache following a fall, complained of decreased vision, lack of concentration, and difficulty in working for one month. 
In addition, he was on follow-up with a urologist at another hospital for lower urinary tract symptoms and poor urinary stream for six months. He had a past history of hypertension and ischemic heart disease that was controlled on medication. Medical examination wasn't, there was nothing uh, remarkable. However, neurological examination revealed left side uh, homony homonymous hemianopia, uh, which is loss of vision on the same side, uh, loss of vision field on the same side of both eyes. So, for example, if there's loss of vision on the left side, on the left side, there's also loss of vision on the left side of the right eye. Uh, you also had a tandem gait, and uh, examination revealed a large prostate with no nodularity. MRI of the brain with contrast revealed a focal, well defined, hypo intense lesion with poor contrast enhancement and significant perilesional edema in the light in the right posterior parietal occipital region. And we can see the mass there, the right hand side. MRI of the pelvis revealed enlarged prostate gland showing abnormal heterogeneous T2 signals on the left lobe with a focal bridge in the capsule and periprostatic lymph nodes. There was no definite involvement of the seminal vesicles. So you can see the enlargement there on some of the prostate. PSA was 8.5 nanograms per mil. Metastatic workup, having bone scan, CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis did not show any visible metastatic disease. He underwent a neuro navigation guided awake craniotomy and excision of the right parietal occipital space occupying lesion. And a highly vascular firm to soft lesion was found in the right parietal occipital region. He recovered well and MRI done post-operatively was fine. Histological examination revealed a glial lesion composed of a glandular pattern with a cribri formation. These glands were lined by cuboidal to columnar cells having pleomorphic hyperchromatic nuclei and variably prominent nucleoli and moderate cytoplasm. Uh, the lumen of the gland also show areas of necrosis. Again, the biomarkers um, showed AE1, AE3 positive, CK720, and, and 20 negative, PSA positive, and synaptopycin, and chromogranin negative. Considering the staining of the H&E and the IHC, it was reported as metastatic adenocarcinoma with a primary likely of prostate origin. And there's an uh, two more infiltrating glial tissue on H and E stain. Uh, that's A1, A3 positivity, on, and that's uh, PSA positivity. Patient subsequently underwent a transrectal ultrasound and had a 12 core prostate biopsy that confirmed prostate adenocarcinoma, Gleason score four and four. Um, they decided after discussion to treat with radiation and hormonal therapy. He received radiation dose of 3,000 centigrade in 10 fractions to the whole brain. After counseling, he opted to have um, bilateral subcapsular orchiectomy. Presently, well, at, at the time it was published, the patient was on follow up. PSA level was 3.31, uh, testosterone was, was at a castration level, and MRI did not reveal any evidence of recurrence. Bone scan was also negative for metastasis. So this is 12 months post-surgery, did not show any evidence of recurrence. This is a 72-year-old male with advanced melanoma metastatic to the lung and the liver. Uh, it was BRAF uh, negative for BRAF mutation. Patient was eligible for immunotherapy. First cycle had um, ipilimumab and nivolumab. Two weeks prior to any adjunct immunotherapy, he developed uh, bloody stools. 
He was then treated with IV methyl prednisolone and IV fluids. Stool studies showed were negative for all those bacteria listed there. There was no ova or parasites. Because the symptoms improved, they continued to treat with oral prednisolone to, uh, with the goal of tapering off over several weeks. After discharge, uh, he wasn't put on CTLA-4 inhibitor because they felt that there could be increased risk of recurrent colitis. He was planned to resume PD-1 inhibitor immunotherapy with nivolumab every three weeks. However, prior to the treatment, he developed uh, four episodes of diarrhea with associated nausea and abdominal pain classified as a grade two toxicity. He was administered an IV dose of methyl prednisolone as an outpatient and asked to continue uh, prednisone at a higher dose and holding back the nivolumab. Symptoms progressed with large volume of, again, bloody stools uh, accompanied by severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain. He was readmitted back to hospital and CT scan revealed moderate circumferential thickening of the large bowel, suggestive of a pancolitis. And that's it there. There was evidence of air in the peritoneum with moderate amount of free in the upper abdomen and focal disruption of the mid-transverse colon, or you can see here, which was felt to be the site of perforation. While all this was going on, they found that uh, he had responded to immunotherapy with a decrease in size of his liver metastasis by up to 70%, and uh, a laparotomy was done to, uh, with extended right hemicolectomy and end ileostomy after the perforations were identified along the cecum and transverse colon. He continued his uh, steroid treatment. However, on the first, first post-operative day, he had a large bloody bowel uh, movement with, without evidence of blood in the ileostomy. Uh, the bloody bowel, uh, the bloody tools continued for into the second post-operative day. And so they were thinking that there might be another perforation. So after discussion, they decided to treat with infliximab. Um, and this was administered. And over the next several days, symptoms improved without further episodes of rectal bleeding. Endoscopic evaluation was deferred because of the risk of um, iatrogenic bowel perforation. Shortly afterwards, he started to have clear fluid and low fiber diet. Continued to improve, and he was eventually discharged to rehab, a rehab facility with instructions to complete the prednisone. Because of the uh, severity of his immune checkpoint inhibitor toxicities, he was no longer a candidate for further therapy. Performance status remained too poor to initiate a second line therapy and surgical restoration of intestinal continuity was never performed. So in, we have rare, very rare cases where it's very difficult to do studies. Um, clinical studies are obviously not possible when cases are rare and you may not even have too many case reports. So what is available for clinicians is the few cases that are reported in the literature, information from, uh, for, for those cases becomes uh, where uh, they, 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 they use the information to plan to treat their patients if they come across a case like that. So this is a 76 year old, year old lady uh, who had a complaint of a pain on the right hip, had several chronic diseases. Uh, she did not have any family history of malignancy. Menarche was 812, menopause at 842. Pap smear within the last year was negative and recent upper and lower gastrointestinal endoscopies were inconsistent with malignancy. 
two months prior to the current presentation, she had a, an ultrasound and mammography uh, that did not identify any abnormalities. Um, no palpable lymph nodes in the axilla, supraclavicular, or inguinal areas. However, vaginal examination revealed a bulky cervix and enlarged 18-week size mobile uterus and normal adnexia. Uh, the vital signs and all, you know, all within normal limits. The blood work was fine. Abdominal and pelvic CT scan showed diffuse metastatic disease with lytic bone lesions. Uterus was enlarged, containing a vague central hypodensity and a 1.8 centimeter hypodensity with punctate calcification in the left adnesa. PET CT showed significant hypermetabolic activity in the cervix and uterus, skeletal metastatic disease, and right axillary adenopathy. There was no activity in the breast. Again, examination of the anesthesia confirmed what they felt clinically initially. So the green arrow showed evidence of disease in the bone. The red arrow is the uterus, and the blue arrow is the um, cervix. The yellow arrow showing the axillary lymph node. Again, you can see the uh, iliac bones here showing evidence of disease metastasis. Um, cervical biopsy showed a cellular stroma infiltrated by a monotonous population of plasmacytoid cells arranged in single file with increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratios and minimal nuclear pleomorphism. Um, malignant tests tested positive for CK7 and GATA3 and 91 to 100% positive for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor supporting their mammary origin. Uh, the HER2 was negative. Uh, this is the histology. CT guided biopsy on the right lymph node, axillary lymph node showed tumor cells that were morphologically identical to the ones observed in the survey. KI67 was 10 to 15%. And patient was treated with uh, palcobciclib, letrozole, and zeledronic acid. Clinical improvement was seen with patient reporting resolution of the pain. This is a 14-year-old girl, not sexually active, had menarche at 10, regular menstrual cycle, BMI was within normal limits, no family history of endometrial cancer. She was referred to the gynecology clinic because of abnormal uterine bleeding and thickening endometrium. She was severely anemic uh, because of sustained vaginal bleeding, was admitted. MRI confirmed a thickened endometrium. Lesions were not observed in the muscle layer, but a solid portion of, with a contrast effect was found in the thickened endometrium. Endometrial hyperplasia and partial mal malignancy were diagnosed um, because of the deficient weighted image showed a high signal and decreased apparent deficient coefficient. She underwent the diagnosing endometrial curettage under anesthesia, and pathology showed atypical hyperplasia in most of the tissues, but some of them exhibited a back-to-back -back structure with high linear density and very narrow interstitium, and it was diagnosed as endometrial adenocarcinoma grade 1. So we can see the thickened endometrium there, that's the muscle of the um, uterus, the myometrium, so there's no infiltration of the myometrium. Immunostaining status of immune patch repair proteins did not indicate germline mutations, and there was no accumulation suggestive of distant metastasis of lymph node metastasis uh, on PET CT. Based on the findings, she was diagnosed as endometrial adenocarcinoma grade 1. Uh, stage 1A by uh, using the FIGO standards. Ideally, the recommendation will have been um, to have a total hysterectomy and bilateral salpingophorectomy, but because of our age and to preserve fertility, uh, hormonal therapy was decided and she was treated with medroxyprogesterone acetate for 
26 weeks. Uh, she had dilatation and curettage at 7, 15, and 26 weeks while on hormonal therapy. And histology of the endometrial biopsy at 7 weeks after starting treatment revealed an atypical endometrial hyperplasia. So it was judged that the hormonal therapy was effective. After 15 weeks, it was benign endometrium and uh, hysteroscopy performed at the end of the uh, MPA confirmed that no obvious proliferative lesion was found in the lesion. During the course of treatment, she developed a pelvic inflammatory disease that was treated with antibiotics. After treating the pelvic inflammatory disease, she was prescribed a low dose uh, estrogen progesterone pill and had periodic ultrasound to estimate the endometrium. She had um, endometrial created every four months under anesthesia. And after 47 weeks, pathological examination and CT imaging have not shown any disease recurrence. So this is what it looked like on histology. And this is the uh, hysteroscopy after treatment that shows that no evidence of disease. Seven, seven year old man, right upper chest pain, one month, non-smoker, uh, did not have any cough, no dyspnea, no coughing up of blood, no loss of weight or headache or dizziness. Past medical history wasn't significant, but he had reduced breath sounds on clinical examination on the right upper zone. Chest X-ray revealed the right middle zone lesion and a subsequent CT scan of the right thorax and liver revealed a 5.8 by 5 mass in the anterior segment of the upper lobe of the right lung, abutting the transverse fissure and infiltrating the lateral chest wall with the region of the third rib. There was also an enlarged right hilar node. So that's the mass there involving the rib and the lymph node. Bronchoscopy confirmed the disease in the anterior segment of the right upper loop. Histology revealed a diagnosis of poorly differentiated non-small cell lung cell carcinoma with marked nuclear polymorphism with no targetable mutations found on further testing. So that's histology and uh, stage was um, say 3A. They recommended radiation therapy, radical radiation therapy. Uh, patient declined, and he also declined the palliative radiation therapy. He opted to alter his diet, increase his intake of fruit and vegetables, and take up exercise. Three months after diagnosis, he reported resolution of chest pain. Repeat scan showed a significant reduction in the size of the upper lobe mass, measuring 3.8 by 2.7 centimeters still invading the right anterior chest wall with associated erosion of the third rib. The limb, uh, right hilar node was also reduced in size. So we can see compared to the previous one, the size of the mass is less. Still had some erosion of the ribs, but not as bad. And the lymph node has reduced in size. So he had serial scans on 6, 9, 12, and 18 months. And the size of the tumor gradually reduced over a period of time. Most recent scan at the time this was published, um, thorax and liver done was 20, 24 months after diagnosis showed a stable focus of soft tissue density at the site of the primary tumor with associated scarring of the adjacent lung parenchyma and tethering of the adjacent pleura and sclerotic changes at the right anterior rib. There were no, hyla, no enlarged hilar nodes and no other lymphadenopathy or metastasis. So this is the there was not just scarring, again, scarring here, and the lymph node had um, completely resolved. So our case report's important in the era of evidence-based medicine. Some people believe that case reports are not important, uh, that it doesn't contribute much to evidence-based medicine because it cannot provide any evidence of efficacy and safety in the diagnosis and treatment of a disorder. Albright and his colleagues looked at 100 cases 
case reports in archives of dermatology and they had several concerns, including that there was publication bias in support of positive results, exaggerated claims of efficacy and safety, inadequate informed consent reporting and underreporting of patient-centered outcomes. Challenge with case reports that from a business perspective, case reports are rarely cited and they create a dilemma for journal editors because they negatively impact uh, negatively affect the impact factor. A high impact factor, as we know, can be a decisive factor for authors who want to consider where to submit their work or for companies who want to determine the allocation of the advertising budgets. Evidence-based methods is exclusively concerned with finding the best evidence for clinical decisions. And from the hierarchy of evidence, randomized trials serves a purpose, a very good purpose, the final evaluation of therapies or tests, especially when their clinical value is not immediately clear cut. However, case reports and case series have other aims that are actually important, uh, that are equally important in the progress of medical science and education. Uh, this is a modified uh, pyramid of um, study design by Murad. So we can see case report and series is here. Randomized trial is there. And then some people be believe that systematic reviews are at the top. Some people believe that, well, systematic reviews have their issues also. Nefield and Gorin retrieved. They looked at 21 cases of tamoxifen-related ocular toxicity in breast cancer patients. As a result of that literature search, they were able to get a clearer picture of the nature and distribution of the toxicity, as well as severity of ocular findings. They also recognized the difficulty in attributing ocular findings to tamoxifen and other competing causes of retinal, macular, and corneal abnormalities. Nodding uh, also conducted a 20-year literature review of case reports and series of primary carcinoma of the fallopian tube. As a result of this review, they were able to outline patient characteristics, describe causes of treatment failure, and at the time that there were lack of control trials and usefulness of a second look laparotomy for monitoring disease response to the treatment given. Uh, we also looked at herbal therapy used by cancer patients. 18 reports had apparent anti-tumor effect, 21 had toxic effect. And at the time, there were clinical trials uh, identified for green tea, phytoestrogens, mistletoe, and so on. Uh, there were also some prospective studies for pieces, pears, or palmito. Conclusion was that many of the herbs with promising case report findings have neither yet been explored or results have not been reported in English. So what can meta-analysis of case reports give us? It can really give us characteristics and, and case outcomes can be assessed uh, at this level of clinical research. However, we know that if they are uh, where there's no other evidence, the best of the first line of evidence must be taken into account. Over the last several years, uh, new peer review journals that focus on publishing case reports have emerged, and they are mostly open access journals with high acceptance rates. In contrast to subscription-based and peer-reviewed e-journals, many of these new case report journals are not adequately reviewed. So what does the impact of case report on medical literature? This is an old slide. Uh, looking at case reports that go from case reports to clinical trial, here, 17% uh, and 83% did not go. And going to case series, there was a slight improvement. Uh, we had 31% and then 69 did not go to clinical, or did not proceed to clinical trial. So how do you write a good case report? Title, keywords, abstract, a good introduction, patient information, clinical findings, the timeline. 
diagnostic assessment, therapeutic intervention, follow-up and outcomes discussion, patient perspective and informed consent. This was by the care group written a few years ago. And so case reports should be written in an organized and structured manner. It's still relevant in medicine today and in rare instances where clinical trials are not possible for ethical reasons, case report series may be the only evidence available to recommend treatment. Thank you, and I'll credit my colleagues. <laughs> Any questions? questions? So, on my emails now, almost every day I get new journals, they're online journals, and they ask you to write an article and please have it ready in two weeks. Do you see this with case reports as well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, that'll do it. Thank you. Thank you very much.